Sometimes a new modern video game releases and kind of feels more like an older game, be it from the corporation side stuff, like, you know, maybe it has no microtransactions or an always online requirement, or the game is just filled with old school unlocks, or maybe it just plays like an old school game. There are a ton of examples, and today we want to talk about 10 of them. So let's get started off with number 10. Let's talk about Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown. Now, even though this game could have easily just drawn from the Sands of Time trilogy, its actual inspirations come from something a little uh, older, the Castlevania Symphony of the Night. We weren't expecting a return to this series anytime soon. I mean, it, it's been dead for what, more than 10 years now? So to see Prince of Persia return as an exploration-based side-scrolling action platformer is unexpected, but in hindsight, the change actually really works and makes sense with the roots of the franchise. So the basics of what you're doing here should be familiar to anyone who's played a Metroidvania. You know, you explore a sprawling environment, discover power-ups, fight bosses, and unlock new tools that let you progress further and revisit areas differently. Now, what makes this game different is how it incorporates that Prince of Persia flavor, mostly by putting in a lot of traps. The challenge in this game comes from traps almost as much as it comes from fighting enemies. Hell, uh, some of these platforming segments might definitely be harder. This is a game that does not mess around when it comes to difficulty. If you're the type looking for something modern with an old school challenge, then you'll probably like this game. It pulls no punches. It still manages to feel modern with some intelligent additions like the ability to take a picture that'll show up on your map. So if you hit a roadblock, you'll always know exactly where something is and what it is. It's a good way to keep track of Metroidvania style stuff where in the old days you'd probably scribble it down in a notebook. This is a game that takes the ideas of old games but remixes them into something that feels refreshingly classic but smartly designed and new. Now, next over at number nine, Armored Core 6. Now, games don't really get as old school as this. Most of the time, these sorts of uh, classic series reboots try to update the presentation a little bit. Even if the gameplay remains the same, the storytelling is less sparse and more bombastic. I mean, just look at Baldur's Gate 3 and it's very flashy opening. Armored Core 6 doesn't do any of that stuff. The presentation is just as sparse and ambiguous as it's always been. You do not see one other human being in this game. There are plenty of people who talk to you, but all you have to go on is their name and sometimes the machine they pilot if you're lucky, and that's it. Most of the story is told by dialogue boxes over a blank screen. Maybe if you're lucky, you'll get a cutscene arriving at a destination, but you rarely even get that. Before this game came out, many assumed that it would just be Dark Souls, but with mechs. But it's not. It's exactly like the old games. You select a mission from a drop down menu, you do it, and then it's back to the menu to select your next mission or upgrade your machine. It's exactly the same as the old games. Maybe a little sleeker, a little more polished, but otherwise, Pretty identical. The game's devotion to old school design can be seen everywhere. The only bone they throw at a player is the ability to heal mid-mission. It's one of the few bits of modernizations they have here, but otherwise it's shockingly unchanged. If it were anything other than Armored Core, that might have been a problem, but it's not. This game is very cool. Now, next over at number eight, we have Signalis. There have been plenty of survival horror games recently, but few have really tried to match the aesthetic and design of those original PS1 classics. You know, we got a lot of survival horror, but few really attempt to make an old school survival horror game, and Signalis really does it best. This game doesn't just perfectly emulate the feeling of games like eh, Resident Evil, Silent Hill 2, or uh, Parasite Eve. It manages to feel like its own unique thing at the same time. Like, for the most part, the game sticks very close to the formula. You know, you explore a sprawling installation that has a limited amount of resources, but a lot of dangerous enemies. Surviving isn't just about skill, it's about judging what you've got compared to what you'll have to give up to progress. 
Survival is just as much a puzzle as all the actual puzzles. There is no CGI backdrops, but the 3D segments where you zoom in to look at things feel straight out of the PS1 era. For an indie game, the presentation in Signalis is also slick as hell. It's one of the most visually striking games in the past few years, and it shows just how much can really be accomplished with relatively little. The PS1 style visuals may be a turnoff, and the actual challenge is once again pretty old school, but this is one of the most interesting horror games we've seen in a while. It's a throwback that still manages to feel incredibly new. Next over at number seven, Sea of Stars. This uh, indie RPG was made with the express purpose of being a modern day Chrono Trigger. A bold statement if there ever was one, but to their credit, they almost managed to hit that level of quality here. Listen, Chrono Trigger was and still is an all time classic RPG in terms of art, music, pacing. Uh, there's almost nothing else that comes anywhere close. So the fact that Sea of Stars gets even close to that is an achievement all its own. There are tons of games that use uh, pixel art as a crutch, but not here. This is some of the most detailed and beautiful pixel art we've seen in a while. The amount of ways you can move through an environment in this game is pretty impressive too. In most of these types of games, all you can do is walk around on a flat plane, maybe climb a ladder, but in Sea of Stars, you're jumping you're climbing, you're shimmying on narrow ledges, you're swinging on ropes, it adds a lot more variety to the areas. And the battle system is simple, but clever. It emphasizes momentum and planning over just mashing the attack button. And best of all, uh, the game doesn't like overstay its welcome, like most RPGs. You can finish this one in around 30 hours. Old school RPGs knew when to get in and get out, man. After playing multiple hundred hour RPGs back to back recently, we're getting real nostalgic for games that are short and filled with quality in comparison. Now next over at number six, we have Shadow Gambit, The Cursed Crew. This is basically just a spot for the Game Ranks team to gush about uh, German developer Me Me Me's work. From Shadow Tactics to Desperados 3 and now Shadow Gambit, they've been doing some really stellar work making games that are heavily inspired by games like Commandos and the Desperado series, but bring a lot of innovation to the table. Now, if you don't know, these games are essentially real-time tactical games with a focus on stealth where you coordinate a small group of highly specialized characters to complete your objectives. Now, these games are heavily inspired by the Commandos games. That's not like that's not a secret they're totally open about it and it's so great to see because those old games were great unique things that you just don't see anymore each mission is like a complex puzzle that you have to just slowly unravel where you have to use the right combination of characters in order to carefully thin out the enemy forces and clear the place out all of these games are great but shadow gambit feels like a real step forward for these games by making it so you can bring whichever characters you want into any mission and making the campaign non-linear so there's really an additional level of replayability here Shadow Gambit also gives you some of the most entertaining abilities yet. Uh, they just throw out any sense of realism this time and just let you go crazy with pirate magic. It's a lot of fun. It feels like these devs are like the very few in this business making this stuff, which sucks because uh, they announced that they're closing down last year. That's unfortunate, but at least they went out on a high note. Now. X over at number five, Crash Bandicoot 4, it's about time. Now, listen, we know this game kind of has a bad rap for admittedly absurd completion requirements. If you want to 100% complete this game, you're not gonna have a good time. But in every other way, this thing is one of the best, more complete platformer games we've seen. This is an old school throwback game done right. There are no microtransactions. You just buy the game and get what you want. It looks great, it controls well, and it's full of content. There's a metric boatload of like these costumes you can unlock here, and they're all free. Only something like Spider-Man comes close to the amount of stuff 
this game gives you right now. And on that front, we can't really complain. The platforming is silky smooth, the level design is solid. Sure, the levels go on for a bit too long, and some of the ways they hide boxes are borderline cruel, but hey, you're definitely getting your money's worth with this one, specifically with how they nailed the Crash Bandicoot feel. The new characters, the new story, the presentation, yes, it feels like, you know, the post Naughty Dog Crash Bandicoot stuff, it's different, but the actual feel of playing, they nail that old school feeling. Now over at number four, of course, we have Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge. It doesn't get much more unabashedly old school than the humble beat-em-up game. These are about as basic and cool as they get. You walk forward and pummel the shit out of anything that moves. It's a simple formula that they like spent a long time on the back burner, but after the success of Streets of Rage 4 trying to bring things back, it seems like the genre is just back and better than ever and being embraced by some of the mid-tier to bigger publishers. Now this one may be up for debate, but like if we're gonna put a new game on here, then it's gotta be Shredder's Revenge. This game is just fun to play. It is F-U-N. It's nostalgic as hell for anyone who grew up with the Turtles, and it's just a good time. With beat-em-ups, it pretty much all relies on the quality of the art, the music, and the controls. And this game hits all that stuff at and apart. The characters are highly expressive, they have great animations, the backgrounds are full of detail, and the music is fantastic all around. The game knows exactly what it takes to make a great beat-em-up. It's smooth, and it checks those boxes easily. it's even a little longer than your traditional beat-em-up. Usually these things can be finished in like an hour or so if you're good, but this one's a little longer. Maybe too long, depending on how much of a genre purist you are, but we're all for it. I mean, the more game, the better. It's not like it's an endless slog. It's the difference between an hour or a couple hours. Not a big deal, but when you say uh, they don't make them like they used to anymore, I often point to kind of Streets of Rage 4, but really TMNT Shredder's Revenge here. Now, over at number three, Bomb Rush Cyberfunk. If you were ever lucky enough to play either Jet Set Radio or the Xbox exclusive sequel, Jet Set Radio Future, you already know why this game is on the list. These games were great. They had a unique style and an amazing soundtrack that's never quite been replicated, you know, until now. Uh, Bob Rush Cyberfunk is a spiritual successor in every sense of the word. It's like as close as possible to just being a straight up sequel without actually infringing on Sega's intellectual property. But in this case, we're not complaining because it's a great game. The basic gist of the game is that you roll into these large, open-ended levels, grind on rails, walls, even ceilings, tag everything in sight. There's a trick system that comes into play in certain missions, but you're spending most of the game just rolling around these different cool areas while the funky as hell soundtrack plays. There are a few modern innovations here, like, you know, the ability to take off your skates and just walk around to make certain platforming segments a little easier, but uh, this is otherwise just Jet Set Radio Future with a few modernizing features and a new soundtrack. And you know what? That's great. That's all we wanted. Next at number two, Cassette Beasts. Now, if you're looking for a Pokemon alternative that's not PAL World, uh, Cassette Beasts is probably what you're looking for. There's a lot you could say about PAL World, but it doesn't actually play like a Pokemon game, while Cassette Beasts does. This throwback RPG makes a lot of clever changes to the standard classic Pokemon formula. Battles are still turn-based, you're still exploring the world from a top-down perspective. Combat is still mostly like a rock, paper, scissors affair, but how it's actually done is a lot smarter.
there's some actual strategy to the battles in this game. You can't always just brute force it, at least at first, and the world is a more interesting place to explore the way it's built out. If you're feeling nostalgic for those old Game Boy Pokemon games and the newest entries just aren't scratching that itch for you, then Cassette Beasts may be the game you're looking for. It's cool. Now down at number one, uh, you guessed it, it's Baldur's Gate 3, because there was a pretty good stretch of time where it felt like the entire CRPG genre was just dead. We're talking about games like the original Baldur's Gate, original Fallout, Icewind Dale, the list goes on. Uh, there were a ton of these things in the mid to late 90s, but it didn't take long for the well to dry up and all those classic developers either moved on to what was understood to be more popular, uh, mainstream genres, or they just closed shop completely. Series that started out as crunchy, top-down, role-playing heavy games were given the Bethesda treatment or turned into action RPGs rather than continue that original genre. Now look, we're not complaining about Bethesda's vision for Fallout here, those are some great games, but they don't play like the original older games at all, they're their own thing. With the growing popularity of indie games and more mid-budget studios popping up, more and more classic Western-style RPGs have been coming out, and they're all good. But Baldur's Gate 3 is just head and shoulders above everything in terms of ambition. What else needs to be said about this one? It's been talked to death at this point, you know? It's a remarkable achievement that somehow manages to be both wildly popular while retaining the more niche design ethos of those old RPGs. It's dense, it's complicated, with a lot of moving parts that can lead to friction, but because of that, it can be extremely satisfying to figure it all out. There are a lot of modern ideas at play with this game. You know, it's not a total throwback. There are a few new ideas here, uh, you know, but the top-down view, the party management, the complicated rules, the choices, it's all in the spirit of old CRPGs, just repackaged in a way that makes it accessible to a lot more people, and it's awesome. Those are 10 games, but we got two bonuses for you as well. Two more we couldn't fit in, a short one and a long one. The first, the short one is Pizza Tower. Like It's like if you combined Sonic the Hedgehog, Wario Land, and Complete Madness into a single game with some 90s animation cartoon stuff. Now we've gushed about this game before, so we're not gonna waste too much time about it here, but the game is bizarre and brilliant, and the music kicks ass. Also, Arzette, the Jewel of Faramore. Now, most of the time when a game comes out that's a spiritual successor to something, there's a certain logic there. Maybe it's like a beloved series that was killed too soon or a game that there's a lot of nostalgia for, but there isn't anyone nostalgic for the Zelda CDI games. <laughs> the games are incredibly bad. Nobody could actually afford to play them because the CDI was so expensive. And like, what else do we need to say? The games kind of sucked and the CDI was kind of a flop. Well, apparently there's one person out there who looks back on these games fondly because seriously, this game actually exists. And here's the really shocking thing. It's honestly pretty cool. They take the one really memorable thing about like the Zelda CDI games and emulate them here perfectly. It's just the right level of unsettling and amateurish, but everything else is improved. Like we're shocked that this thing exists at all, let alone that it's actually a, a good game. I mean, we're aware that this was made by the guy who did the remastered versions of the CDI game for PC, but to go the extra effort of making an unofficial sequel is something else. We're glad it exists though. Those were a lot of wild and interesting games to talk about, a trip down memory lane, so if you got any more for us, we'd love to hear you down in the comments. But if you just like chatting games with us every day, clicking the like button's all you gotta do to help us out. It legitimately helps and we appreciate it. But uh, as always, thank you guys for watching and we'll see you guys next time.